Next, the contrast principle. So when we make judgments uh, on which we eventually base our decisions, then we also often use reference points. Now, what you choose as a reference point will influence um, your judgment. So if you have to decide how tall I am, for example, uh, whether you use a Smurf or a basketball player uh, as a reference point will have an influence on your judgment because we tend to overestimate the difference that we see and observe between the two. So if you take a Smurf, you would see me as a huge giant. If you take a basketball player, well, you probably see me as a Smurf, very small. Um, now, how can you use that in persuasion? By basically influencing which uh, reference point people take and use in their decisions. For example, with regard to price. So if you sell, sell something uh, very expensive first with a very high price and then offer some additional goods that are far less expensive, they see even more less expensive, even more, well, the price seems lower. Um, so this is what often is, is done by car salesmen. Uh, they sell you the car first and then you get an additional package uh, I don't know, chrome wheel things and leathery interior things. And they are quite pricey, but not in the light of the price of the new car. So if you use uh, the contrast principle in this way, you should first uh, make a sell for the very expensive one and then come up with the additional aspects. Uh, another example is real estate agent. I, I don't know if you ever bought a house, uh, but if you plan on, you will get there that a real estate agent will first, after you're very excited, take you to your first house and then it's a very expensive house and, and it only has like one room and you have to share it with some rats and it looks awful and there is no window and nothing. And he said, well, there you have it. This is what you, you can buy for your money. Anything after that will look like sweet heaven. So the next house that is a bit in line and uh, with your wishes uh, seems so much sweeter. That's how they use it. Be careful for that. So a specific case in which uh, you can use reference point, namely by adding alternatives. Now, this can be best explained with an example. Okay, so you have some money. Really? Yeah, you do. You have some money and you would, you want to put it on uh, a savings account. Um, let's assume the bank you're going to offer two uh, saving account. This is saving account number A and you get well, let's make it interesting. You get 3.2% interest. However, there is a catch. You can't touch your money for five years. Not use it, uh, don't touch it, just look at it, five years. Um, then we have option B, account number B, <clears throat> which is better in interest rate. It offers 3.4%. But um, you can't touch it for 10 years. Okay, which one would you choose? Um, a small increase in interest rates and a, a difference in number of years. You will probably go for A, am I right? Um, the difference in years just uh, isn't compensated probably enough by the small uh, difference in interest rate. Right now, this particular problem um, uh, was actually a bank was facing this. I don't know about the numbers, but it was facing this problem. And they invited a um, scientist, a, a behavioral scientist, to solve this problem for him. In could he um, increase the number of people taking option B? And he said, do the following: create 
account number C, which has an interest rate of 3.45%, making the number up, and uh, but you have to put it down for 15 years. Now the bank said that is ridiculous. Nobody's going to take option C. No, probably not. But in the light of option C, option B looks a lot more sweet, right? We use reference point. Now, in the original decision, the reference point for B was A. And then it didn't look that sweet, but now you're using option C as a reference point, account C as a reference point to evaluate B. And then you're thinking, wow, that's just a small difference here. And look at it. You have to put in five more years of non-touching. In this light, option B looks a lot better. Yay! Now, this works for a lot of things. Let me draw it more abstract. Um, let's assume you want to buy a pants. Really? Am I now drawing a pants? It's, oh God, it's not a good pants. Okay, well, pants. I, yeah, that's a pens. Okay, so you want to buy a pens and you have two characteristics on which you want to determine your decision. Uh, just a uh, comfort and um, on the other hand, uh, how it looks. So we have um, the pens that you're, uh, we have two pens that you're holding in your hands and pens number A. This is comfort, and this is looks. Pens A scores A. One on uh, the looks, but it scores a three on comfort. Wow, very comfortable pens, uh, but it looks crap. Now the other one is a three on looks, but only scores a one. On comfort. Very nice looking, but awful to wear. So, option B. For which one do you go if looks and comfort are equally important to you? Now, by adding a third one, let's do it here, that only scores a two on comfort, not that comfortable, but is equally bad looking as number A. This increases. This completely shifts around the decision landscape in which you make that decision. Now, option A, that scores higher uh, on comfort than C, looks more sweet. So, by adding alternatives that are maybe not that interesting by itself, number C, uh, you can change the decision landscape and thereby influence people into uh, buying, deciding other stuff. Alternatives. So, a situation that is linked to the Ravidar uh, interest rate experiment, so to call it, and a very specific case in which the alternatives present play an influence of have influence over our decisions and our judgment is the compromise. So, you're sitting in a restaurant, think about it, you're sitting in a restaurant, let's make it a first date, and uh, you're going to have a great meal and you want some wine to accompany this. You are asked, wait for the menu, and then you see on the wine list, number one, a very expensive wine. This is a grape that was flown in from France, one grape at the time, to the Netherlands, and it was squashed into a great wine. Very expensive. And we have, uh, on the low side, we have, I don't know, a carton box, and, uh, which is wine by the gallon. I don't know, I'm, I'm not making this up. So, and we have the middle option, uh, which is more expensive than the first one, but less expensive than the first one, the expensive one. So which one would you choose? Um, often people will go for the middle one. Why? On the one hand, they like the more affordable option, which if you provide them with two options, the very expensive one and the cheap one, they would probably go for the cheap one. 
But now by adding the middle one, now having the middle one, they tend to compromise. So uh, you pay a bit more, but you expect a bit more quality. That's the compromise. So another example, chicken meat. So I don't know if you, you probably watched the, the, the star system, right? So one star lives in a tiny house. Uh, you have metal music playing all day in the dark. Uh, it is not good life. And then we have three stars, which is, well, you get killed in the end, but, but the life, so much better. So that's, that's better, but very expensive. Ooh, so this is a trade-off. Uh, better life for a chicken, very expensive, dreadful life for the chicken, and cheap as hell. Which one do you go for? And the compromise, the two stars. So, killed in the end, uh, maybe a dreadful existence, but classical music playing all the time. You make the compromise, the concession there as well. And this is what we often see by adding you can play around um, with the decision frame of the consumer and thereby steer their behavior.